Hey there, welcome to the Compared to podcast and video cast. I'm Heather Creekmore, and today I'm here with my friend Mary Demuth. Mary is an international speaker and podcaster, and she's the novelist and nonfiction author of over 40 books. I was going to guess it was like 100, Mary, <laughs> but, but some of her latest include We Too, How the Church Can Respond Redemptively to the Sexual Abuse Crisis, um, and she's got a brand new one coming out next week, so we'll talk about that soon. She loves to help people restory their lives. She lives in Texas with her husband of 29 years and his mom to three adult children. You can find out all about Mary at marriagemuth.com, and we'll talk about that at the end of the show. Mary, thank you so much for being on the Compared to Who show today. Thanks for having me. It's so fun to be here. So you all just need to know that this woman right here is responsible in large part <laughs> for the podcast and the books I have. And let me explain <laughs> that. So when I wrote my first book and had this really, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I learned that I needed to write a book proposal. And so I Googled how to write a book proposal and I found a document by Mary online. And then I decided to stalk Mary because you know, that's, that's what you do. And I found out that she lived like 15 minutes from my house. <laughs> and better than that, she had a writer's club, 15 minutes from my house. And so a very nervous me showed up with my five pages of writing, having no idea whether or not this stuff was any good, could ever be published. And I remember showing up at that first Writers Club meeting, and you were so encouraging to me. <laughs> and, um, and you've been encouraging me to me since then. I know we had coffee, and we've gotten together mm -hmm. on a number of occasions. So, Mary, I just need to start the show by saying thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank oh, you, thank you. That's so sweet. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And when I saw your writing, I knew this is going to be published. So Aww. I'm really excited that you kept going because this process of writing a book and getting it published is like the worst kind of process. <laughs> so really to persevere is. through it is a really big deal. Uh, it really is. And you've been such an encouragement to me. And, you know, this is, this is a little bit of an aside from where we're going today, folks. But, but we've been talking about eternity and heaven and things like that at, at church. And I think about the fact that Mary, you have like spiritual grandchildren. You're not old enough to be grandmother, <laughs> <laughs> but spiritual grandchildren, I think through this ministry because of your encouragement to me and women that have been encouraged through this ministry. So, so thank you for that. But today, what I would love to talk about, you've got a brand new um, Bible study coming out through Lifeway, and that's all about healing and healing from your past. And so I'd love for you to talk about that. And we're going to get into some of those hard issues of things from our past that maybe we've held on to or not fully been able to process um, in order to find freedom. So we're going to get into that later. But Mary, would you just start off by telling us just a little bit about you and your story and kind of what your background is? Yeah, so I um, had a difficult upbringing, uh, as many people do, so I don't pretend to think that I'm the only one. Um, I lived in a home of several divorces. Uh, there was drug abuse in the home, um, a lot of abandonment, just I felt alone all the time and basically had to raise myself as an only child. When I was five years old, I was sexually abused by two teenage boys for the period of a year, and thankfully we moved away by the end of that year. But I always felt like I had like this moniker on me that said, come find me and come molest me. So um, I was constantly running away from predators most of my uh, childhood life. My biological father died when I was 10, and this was during my mom's third marriage. And then my mom's third marriage, when I was in the seventh and eighth grade, started to fall apart. And as you can imagine, having... Uh, a father die and then a stepfather leave, it felt like my world was coming undone. And that's when I was very suicidal and um, just didn't know why I was even on earth except to be hurt or completely ignored. Mm -hmm. And it was um, my ninth grade year, I started to go to Young Life and hear about the gospel. And in the 10th grade, I went to a weekend camp and met Christ. And that inaugurated my healing journey to this very moment. I'm not completely healed. I would um, hate it if people said things like that because it would discourage those who struggle in the healing process. And uh, I've had a really long healing journey. And uh, by God's grace, I'm married. I have uh, three adult kids, as you said, and they seem okay. So that's awesome. And uh, 
almost 30 years of marriage. So um, it's a testament to the faithfulness of Jesus that you can endure some of the most hardest mm -hmm. tragedies of life. And yet with him, you can have a good, good life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I want to bring out two things that you just said. And the first was the, the healed, the past tense vernacular. Yeah. And I really appreciate you saying that because that is one thing that I try to distinguish, especially, you know, for women that are going through body image issues of any kind. It's like, yes, you can have freedom. But freedom doesn't mean you never struggle again. Freedom doesn't, it's not like you've, you've crossed a finish line and now you're, you know, oh, I'll never think about my weight again. I'll never think about my size again. I'll never look in the mirror and go, ugh, again. <laughs> so it's that, I'm glad you brought that out because I, I do believe we're, we're kind of constantly in, we're constantly in the process of sanctification, right? Yes. If nothing else, <laughs> we're being sanctified, but, but God is growing us and changing us. So I, I appreciate you uh, making that distinction. But the other thing you said about feeling like you had been marked, and I know you've, mm -hmm. you've written a book called Unmarked. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you've written about this in some of your other books too, but that's something I hear a lot from, from friends that I know that have gone through sexual abuse. Can you kind of flesh that out a little bit more? I think it's two reasons. I think one, the vulnerability of having gone through it is a little bit of a beacon. Mm -hmm. um, and I think actually, as I look back at my own story, I am pretty sure I was abused prior to that. And I think I walked into the situation, not willingly, of course, but uh, I think I'd been groomed prior to that. So mm -hmm. there was all of that going on. I think the other thing that we have to remember is that predatory people are really smart mm -hmm. and they know they just have a sixth sense about them. They know who is an easy victim. Mm -hmm. And so that's just a warning to parents to, um, to really help their kids understand that predatory people are really good at what they do. And they're usually awesome and charming mm -hmm. and they're usually the best person and the person you would never think, which is part of their MO because it's part of their master plan. So if they get caught, then everyone would be like, oh, I can't imagine. No, that can't be true. I won't believe the victim. I'll just believe that person. So that's kind of the twofold reason why I think there's this beacon that, that tends to happen. And the more free you get and the more you understand your worth, the more you're able to kind of push against those predatory people. But I have, you know, definitely even in adulthood, like we've been talking about, you know, um, I'm not fully healed. Even in adulthood, I've fallen prey to predatory people. Mm. And those aren't necessarily like men who are trying to prey on me, although that happened. Um, but also like women who, um, predatory friends that mm. uh, I let get the best of me, so to speak. Yeah. And that, that brings up another one of your books, your, your friendship book. Yes. What is it? The deadly seven the, deadly, remind me of the title of it, Mary. <laughs> yeah. That's it, the seven deadly friendships. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's all kinds of numbers out there. <laughs> I want to yes. get it wrong. <laughs> seven deadly friendships. Yes. Yeah. That's another great book. If, and so if you're listening today and you've, you've struggled with friendships and why am I attracting the wrong friends or do I yes. keep getting myself into these friendship situations that are frustrating and feel kind of wrong, um, read Mary's book, uh, The Seven Deadly Friendships, because it was a real resource for that. Well, so, so can you kind of tell us a little bit, what, what has been your process to kind of move forward in your healing journey? Like, I know your book is unmarked. <laughs> yes. So, you know, what, what has been your process of finding your worth uh, on, on your journey? Stops and starts, definitely. Um, I still struggle with finding my worth. But I would say the most important thing I did was in college, so I'd been a Christian for maybe three years, I started to tell my story to trustworthy and sweet people. Mm -hmm. And often I will tell people that an untold story never heals. Mm -hmm. If we shove it down and, and we don't want anyone to know about our terrible past or the thing that happened to us, we won't heal from it. You have mm -hmm. to bring it out into the light. And so a big portion of just a chunk of healing came in college when the dear friends just laid hands on me and prayed for me for mm -hmm. four years. And I basically just cried through those four years. Um, I was so broken. I was so needy. And of course in college is when everything comes roaring to life. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm really grateful for that. So that was a big part of it. But then something that kind of stopped the growth is I kind of did this 
I kind of wiped my hands of it all and I kind of made a little declaration. Mm -hmm. I said, henceforth, <laughs> I am healed and I'm never going to deal with this again. Hallelujah. And I also told God that he owed me a perfect life because mm -hmm. I'd had this crappy upbringing and I'm mm -hmm. like, nope, no more pain. And those two things didn't work out well for me. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, once you get married and you're a sexual mm -hmm. abuse survivor, you have to deal with having sex. So um, that, that was pesky. And also I started having children. And when my uh, oldest reached five and she was the little girl, I just relived everything again and had to go back to counseling. So my process has been talking about it, counseling, um, praying, lots of prayer, um, trauma therapy, uh, just all sorts of variety of things. But I would say, and I don't mean this to be dismissive of counseling at all because I've gotten a lot out of it, but I would say so much of it has come from just me telling my story to really mm -hmm. sweet people and having them pray. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. And it also kind of makes me think of that C.S. Lewis quote where when you share your story, how many people come back and say, you know, what, you know, you too, I thought it was just me. And so how much right. freedom you bring to other people and they're like, I've never told anyone that, but since you have the courage to share that, then <laughs> yeah. I have the courage to share my story with you. Mm -hmm. And that kind of segues a little bit into your, your book that came out, I believe it was last year, the We Too, hashtag We Too mm -hmm. book um, about just how the church has handled sexual abuse in the church. Would you like to tell us just a little bit about that? Yeah, I wrote that because I kept hearing these same stories about people church leadership praising the perpetrator and marginalizing the victim. And that didn't make any sense to me because if I thought about Jesus for a minute, um, mm -hmm. he would not have done that. He would have called out the perpetrator and done everything possible to protect the, the survivor. Mm -hmm. And he would have believed the survivor. And mm -hmm. so um, thus began a very long journey of just researching what has the Bible say about sexual assault also um, what has church history said about mm -hmm. how this has been processed? And honestly, it started really well. Um, there were, within the Catholic Church, in the beginnings of the Catholic Church, there were several kind of reformers who talked about this issue, in particular about pedophilic priests. Mm -hmm. But during the Reformation, what happened was the Catholic Church really pulled itself back into itself. And we're all about reputation management. And that same kind of DNA obviously because the protestant church came from the catholic church all that dna just stayed and it's been this kind of secretive let's mm -hmm. keep that quiet we don't talk about that stuff in church um if there's a leader that does it we're just going to quietly dismiss and let him go perpetrate or her perpetrate somewhere else i mean this pattern's gone on until this decade mm -hmm. and um, thankfully god is saying enough and the light is being shed. And so my hope in writing that book was just to bring light from a perspective of someone who absolutely adores the church. So mm -hmm. I'm not, I didn't write the, the book to be like, oh, the terrible church and they just get it wrong all the time. No, there's great parts of the church. This is yeah. just an issue that I believe is part of revival and God is bringing it to light so that we can be revived and um, understand what's going on in the world today and how to lovingly empathize with people who are hurting. Yeah, that's really good. And so kind of to that end, I mean, we know that we have people in our churches that are hurting, mm -hmm. right? So, so we're going to take two different angles on this. First of all, the first angle is, is for someone who hasn't ha doesn't have that story. How, how can we help? What, what can we do? Right. So that is, that's why I wrote this into the light. Oh, well <laughs> the then that's the perfect segue. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, well, it, the, the study is for, it's twofold. It's for the person who wants to help people who are broken and maybe doesn't know how. Mm. Um, or is the for the person who is compassion fatigued? They've been helping for so long they can't bear another story. Mm. But underneath all of that is also a journey of healing. And so it's kind of got that twofold thing. It helps you to heal from your story so that you can help other people heal from their story. Mm. And that process can be very beautifully biblical. And that's why it's a Bible study um, because it helps people to uncover the word of God in a way maybe that they never have before in a very realistic feet on the ground kind of way. Like, you know, people are asking questions like, 
if God really loves me, why did this happen to me? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a very honest question and one I do not want people to dismiss, but to work Mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the process of healing is asking the questions you you think that the church people won't let you ask, but you need Mm -hmm. to do it because God already knows you're thinking it. So why not, you know, work it out with him? Absolutely. Yeah, that's really great. And so that Bible study will be available June 8th, I know, mm-hmm. next week. Um, might be this week by the time you're listening to this. <laughs> yes, exactly. But, uh, but in, in, what's the format of that, Mary? Is it, is it for groups? Uh, could you yeah. do it by yourself or just with a couple <laughs> yes. of friends? Or what's, what's the format? Yeah, all of those things. So okay. there's, there's a book that you can just buy and go through by yourself. And uh, it's a nice healing journey um, to take you from A to B. Uh, but if you go through it and you feel like, I really want my friends to go through this too, then you can take them through. And there's a video element as well. I was filmed, um, at my church at Lake Point in Rockwall, uh, teaching seven different times about how this, how we are in this healing journey. And, um, so yes, you can bring it through, uh, you can do it virtually with people. There are ways and apps where you can, um, all watch the same thing at the same time. So um, it does not have to be in person, but it can be remotely. Um, although I do love in person and I really miss it. <laughs> so mm-hmm. there's that too. Oh yes. So Zoom fatigue is real. <laughs> yes, it is. So, well, Mary, because you're on the Compared to Who show, one question that I always ask is, is what has your struggle with body image and comparison been like? And and I, I love the fact that you you do have this this the story that is maybe a little different than some of the stories that I've been able to share before on the show. So, so kind of flesh out what your journey has been like. And then also what, what is a common journey for someone who has suffered horrible sexual abuse as you have? Right. So the one thing that's a, a barrier is, um, believing that your body is all that matters mm-hmm. and that it's where your worth lies. Mm-hmm. And so Um, that works really well when you are happy with how you look. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't work very well when you're not happy with how you look. But if you've been, if it's been ingrained in you that your worth is how you appear to someone that's going to prey on you. Mm -hmm. um, And that's really twisted. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. It totally didn't make sense to me that I struggled with this because I thought, well, I I should be like repulsing that um, kind of attention, right? I should be like, I should push it away. But I realized that um, if we're broken in a particular way, we tend to try to complete a story that's incomplete. So Mm -hmm. in my mind, I was like, if I could just find someone, find me attractive and the story... Can you still hear me, Mary? Can you hear me, Mary? So what I was trying to do was to recreate or finish a story that was unfinished. And so I kept chasing after what I couldn't have, so to speak. And, and there was a lot of body image involved in that. And a lot of feeling like I wasn't enough if I didn't attract attention. Um, But there's also, you know, a couple of other things that people, I just got an email from a woman this week and she said, she's really, struggled in high school with anorexia um, and almost died from it. Mm-hmm. And now she's um, 100 pounds overweight. And I, I told her, um, I just want you to offer yourself some grace because this is a very, very common reaction to sexual abuse. Mm-hmm. In fact, a lot of times when I meet someone who's struggling with their weight, I if, if the conversation goes that way, Um, we explore sexual abuse because it's excessively common. Mm -hmm. And the reason people struggle with it is they'll either try to do what I did, which hyper be 
cute, you know, or uh, um, desirable mm -hmm. uh, by eliminating food, or we're so freaked out by, by being touched by somebody mm -hmm. that <clears throat> we eat a lot of food. And, um, and it's, of course, not all about food, but you know what I'm saying? We just let ourselves go because we think, well, if I'm overweight, then I won't be attractive. And I do not have to deal with these difficult thoughts. Mm -hmm. The other part of all of this is learning to realize that you are, um, you are not meant for abuse. Um, and that was very pesky in marriage as well. And, you know, we have walked through some hard valleys of me having to say, this is hard. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, for me, it was about choosing and not always being able to choose to interact and be uh, available that way. And um, I just want to offer your, your watchers and listeners some grace. Mm -hmm. First of all, that it's normal. You're normal to struggle. A hundred percent of people who have been sexually abused struggle with the intimate act of marriage, hundred percent. And so that is, is difficult. And um, talking about it frankly with your spouse is a really good way to start and also getting some counseling because it's very hard. And even I think this relates to, to every human being. So if you were raised in an evangelical circle and you were told your whole life, sex is bad, sex is bad, sex is bad, sex is bad. And then one day you say a bunch of words, you wear a white dress, you put a ring on your finger and suddenly sex is awesome, sex is awesome, sex is awesome. Mm -hmm that is a very weird transition. Mm -hmm. And so even if you've never been abused, that's a very strange transition to go from this is evil to this is good. And I will just say that learning to honor that part of your marriage vows is difficult and it is a journey and it can get better. And um, I'm living proof of that, not to put myself up on a pedestal at all. It's been hard one and I've cried a thousand tears. Um, and then I would say just kind of the last part of your question is, have I struggled with body image? Yes. In particular, as I age, um, had one of those amazing metabolisms growing up that I wish, I wish I would have been more grateful for it back then. <laughs> it was awesome. I could eat anything. Um, but mid age has caught up with me and to be in a different body than I ever expected myself to be in and still having a little bit of that tie of my worth is tied to how I appeal to the opposite sex um, is a def is, is so difficult. And I've been doing a lot of hard work working through it. And um, of course, you know, being healthy and trying to do all that, but it's more than that. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, learning to shake hands with what you see in the mirror and realizing it's not going to get better mm -hmm. um, until we have that awesome heavenly body. It's not, it's entropy happens, you know, it's just <laughs> what it is. Um, and also the other thing I remember, and then I'll stop, but um, I remember like looking at pictures of myself in my twenties and thirties and even forties and thinking I was so cute. And then re realizing when I was in my 20s, 30s, and 40s, I was picking myself apart, like, oh, well, this and that, and oh, those and this. And now I'm like, okay, now that I'm in my 50s, I need to just be happy with where I'm at because it's not going to do me any good to hit myself over the head about how I feel about how I look. So that's my very long answer. Yeah, no, that's awesome. There was, there was so much in there and I kept thinking, oh, we should I know, talk about that. Sorry. Oh, we should, and I probably needed to keep a list. <laughs> but um yeah. Well, let's, let's start with aging. <laughs> so, yes. Um, right, right there, right there with you. A fifties lot closer than 40 <laughs> at this point. And I mean, it is, it is amazing because I do think somewhere in our minds, we see other people age and we hear other people talk about aging. And then I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I kind of thought that won't happen to me. <laughs> I don't oh, know. Yes, it's for those people, <laughs> exactly. but not for me. And, and so, but it, it is, it's an odd experience. And I, my husband and I talk about this all the time. It's like, we still feel young inside, but then the mirror <laughs> shows something different. And, um, and then, you know, you get on, you get on social media and you see people that you, you know, graduated with or went to college with and you're like, oh, they're like middle-aged. And then it's like, wait, oh, that wait, means I am too. I am too. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's all, that's all very real. Um, and then I was just having a conversation with someone yesterday about 
about pictures and the very same thing, you know, if you look back on those pictures that you hated, I mean, I remember when we got our wedding pictures, I thought my arms were way too fat in our wedding pictures. And now I'm like, wow, to you have those arms. <laughs> I mean, I, I like those it, arms. It was, you know, so, but it's, it's interesting. I think, I think that there's a work that God wants to do on us through that you know, through what, what I like to call like objectifying ourselves, right? Because that's really what we're doing when we look at pictures of ourselves. We just, we look at them one dimensionally, like we're supposed to be a magazine cover model, <laughs> you know, and we're not right. Because, but that's who we compare ourselves to. It's like, well, that one dimensional image of her is, is better than this one dimension one dimensional image of me, in my opinion, right? Because that's, you know, the ideal that's set before us. And, and we kind of just objectify ourselves. Like, you know, that's the only thing that, that gives us value. And it's right back to what you were saying at the very beginning is the struggle with believing that our worth is more than our bodies. And, mm -hmm. you know, I can tell you that, that even though I never suffer, suffered sexual abuse, like that, when I got married, I got married believing that that was my value to my husband. Mm -hmm. I was raised in church. Mm -hmm. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> you know, maybe some of those subtle messages about the mm -hmm. role of a wife, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, but, but very much believed that that was, that was my biggest value to my husband. And then when I saw anyone else who was competition, <laughs> right, <laughs> but threatened that, then it was, um, you know, it was, it, it felt threatening, like, well, you know, I don't have any value to him because she would have more value to him. So, so I, I understand all that. Thank you. Thanks for, for <laughs> sharing all of that. Well, Mary, you have so many fantastic books out, but you also have a fantastic podcast that I think would really encourage listeners of this podcast. Will you tell us a little bit about Pray Every Day? Yes, it's super quick. It's five minutes and it, it just, it follows the title. I pray every day for you and we go through scripture. So currently right now we're going through the book of Acts and I, I read about five to 10 verses a day. And then I pray according to that story or that part of scripture for my listeners and they can find it at prayeveryday.show. It's on Alexa, it's on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, blah, 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 blah. But yes, oh, the every day, <laughs> every wow. single day. So what episode are you on now? Uh, 932. Wow. <laughs> uh, 900,000 downloads. <laughs> wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I, I think crazy. Um, yeah. I think it would bless my listeners too. So check, check that out friends. You'll, you'll, uh, you'll really, uh, enjoy that. Um, as we kind of tie things up today, I have a random question for you because you also wrote a book. This is, this is highlights of Mary's book is what this <laughs> podcast has turned into, <laughs> but, but you wrote, you wrote a book called, um, the day I met Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my favorites that you've written and we've been watching the chosen. So my question, have oh, you wow. been able to watch the chosen? <laughs> we have watched some of it. Okay. Um, the, the, the side of me that, and I'm not really a historical fiction writer, but the historical fiction writer side of me is a little cringy. But other than that, I think they're doing, I, I think what they're trying to do is, is really important. Because, well, when I was watching it and just, it kind of, it, it, does I'm not going to say it does the same thing you do in the book because I do think that you you guys tried to stay real close to the biblical narrative <laughs> and, right, and right. they take some more liberties in the chosen but but we've really enjoyed the chosen series but I really I loved if you like the chosen and if you've watched the chosen and enjoyed that I think yeah. that you would enjoy reading Mary's book um, and you wrote it with Frank Viola okay Frank I couldn't remember his name um, but it's the day I met Jesus and it's, it's Mary, why don't you tell me about it? <laughs> yeah. So it, it does kind of take that same idea of going deeper into someone's story. So five women of the new Testament, these are actual people that are populating the new Testament and kind of unpacking their stories based on scholarship. And of course the biblical narrative and what kind of, what does that mean to us today? And so when you have someone like the woman with the issue of blood, what does that, you know, what were the implications for her um, or the woman at the well? Pot, a lot of scholars believe that she was barren. That's why she had so many husbands. She wasn't promiscuous. It's that she could not produce an offspring and that you could easily issue her a certificate of divorce because she wasn't producing offspring, which makes her story even more beautiful and more broken. Right. 
So, you know, just so based on scholarship, so I write the, the fiction narrative, but trying to stay as close to the Bible as possible. And then Frank unpacks it into the so what part of the book. So what does this mean for you? Mm-hmm. It's a really great book. So, so one more book to add to your reading list of, of I don't yeah. know, we talked about 10 different books now, Mary. <laughs> so, so 10 of Mary's 800 that you should check out this summer. Well, um, Mary, everyone can connect with you. Tell us all the places that you'd like to connect with people. Sure. So I'm at Mary Demuth on Twitter and Instagram, uh, marydemuth.com, we too.org. And if people want to get a 21 day free email sequence on how to heal from sexual abuse, Um, I have a a website called writermastermind.com, which is where you'll find the proposal tutorial that Heather talked about at the beginning. So if you need to write a book proposal, those are there. And um, prayeveryday.show. So those are a lot of things, but um, I'm a busy lady. So (laughs) we'll get them all in the show notes so people can connect with you in whichever way uh, works best (laughs) for them. (laughs) Well, Mary, thank you so much for being on the Compared to Who show today. Fun to catch up with you and to see you. I don't see you now that I'm in Austin and and you're still in Dallas. So uh, (laughs) so so thanks thanks for being on, Mary. And, um, And thanks for sharing your story. Appreciate it. Yeah. My pleasure. Um, well, that's all for today's Compared to Who podcast or video cast. Thank you so much for wa- watching. I hope something that you've watched or heard today helped you stop comparing and start living. Bye-bye.